Hi, everyone. I want to thank everyone so much for joining us today. Um, today, we'll be discussing breast cancer abstracts that were presented at ASCO 2021. Um, specifically, we'll be discussing three abstracts today. Um, I want to start us off by introducing our wonderful panel that we have with us today. Um, our moderator is Dr. Kevin Neff, who is the Chief of Hematology Oncology at Highland Hospital and also an Assistant Professor of Clinical Medicine at UCSF. And our panelists are Dr. William Gratisher, who is the Chief of Hematology Oncology in the Department of Medicine um, and also a Professor of Medicine at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern. And uh, Dr. Brofsky, who is the Associate Chief in the Division of Hematology Oncology and a co-director of the Comprehensive Breast Center um, and also a Professor of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Um, and with that, I really wanna start us off by thanking our panel. Um, we're really excited to hear from you. We are gonna give Dr. Brofsky just um, one more minute to join us. Um, and then after that minute is up, we will, we will get started. Adam always takes an extremely long time with his makeup. And then there's, <laughs> then there's that damn glass he's always filling up. So I don't know which of those two things accounts for his delay, but it's one of the two. Oh, that's very funny. Okay, so I do want to um, at least get started. We can uh, maybe start discussing this first abstract. Um, I know Dr. Oh, there he is. Awesome. Hello. Hi. Hi, Dr. Brusky. How are you doing? Great. Hey, um, <laughs> so we doing, are... I don't see you guys. Wait, why don't I not see you guys? Hmm. Where's my uh, view options? There we go. Okay. Hold on one second. Let me just grab a uh, more water. And it's not yeah. vodka. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's not no, vodka. Good. And you know something? It's... And look, I'm wearing shorts, just like I did on Wednesday, uh, Saturday. <laughs> okay, I don't, I don't need to know all that. Yeah, okay, hold on. Neither, neither does the audience. <laughs> okay, we'll, <laughs> we'll give him just uh, another minute to get settled. And then, uh, get Dr. The Nuff, I'll, I'll the hand the reins over to you. <laughs> You're right about the water. Yeah, it's usually a red plastic glass, which is always suspect. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Great. Okay. Um, so, Dr. Nuff, I'll hand it over to you to get started with our first abstract. Dr. Brusky, would you mind giving a, a quick overview of the first abstract, abstract 1063? Yeah, let me kind of get this. Let me look at the whole poster because it's only part of it. Right. Um, hold on here. Let me grab the full poster, which I pulled up. So, uh, Rindo, I think it's Rintodestrin, okay, it's G1T48, is one of a series of, um, of these new uh, SERDs. So they're oral uh, uh, selective estrogen receptor degraders. Uh, and there's a number of these on the market now, and this is one of many. And they presented uh, the phase one results uh, for ER positive HER2 negative advanced breast cancer. Um, so in this particular abstract, um, they gave the drug and it, it basically, it was um, 
basic, it was uh, escalated to 800 milligrams daily with palbociclib 125 milligrams daily. Uh, and it was pretty standard inclusion criteria. Um, uh, there were a number of patients who had a number of regimens prior. I mean, a typical phase one trial uh, where they had a number of regimens prior. It was predominantly a bone, visceral disease, actually. Only uh, four of the 40 patients on the study had bone-only disease. Uh, and when you look at this, um, the, the, it was kind of unusual in that uh, while there was neutropenia and leukopenia, uh, which really came mostly from the palbociclib combination, uh, there really weren't a lot of um, uh, adverse events that could really be attributed to the uh, oral SIRD in this particular trial, which is kind of interesting. And the other interesting thing about this uh, study is that they really looked to see uh, whether there was response uh, in patients who had various uh, mutations, in particular ESR1 mutations. They also had PI3 kinase mutations. They had a few patients who had cyclin D1 uh, mutations. And what they found in the study, and again, these are all very small numbers, uh, is that there were responses in ESR1 variants uh, in the 16 patients who had an ESR1 variant. Uh, and they really were the spectrum of mutations uh, that you expect to have in fulvestrin resistance. Uh, in particular, there were uh, mutations at uh, residue 537, which were very important. Uh, there were also patients with PI3 kinase variants uh, and the typical ones that we would expect. Um, uh, and they actually did also have a response. Uh, in the cyclin uh, mutations, there were only three patients who had a cyclin D1, uh, either mutation or, or um, uh, and in this patient, one of the three responded. I don't know what to make of that. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. This is kind of an interesting abstract uh, in that um, there didn't seem to be a lot of uh, surd specific side effects like bradycardia. Uh, there was a little bit of nausea, but a lot of these drugs have some nausea associated with them. And the second thing is that I think it was one of the first ones that really, I mean, all of these kind of, at least in animal models and cell line models, um, appear to uh, have activity with the ZSR1 mutation. Uh, this is really one that was clinically, that showed clinically uh, that it apparently had activity, not in a huge number of patients, about 16 or 14, whatever, uh, but it still had activity. So I found those are the two uh, interesting parts of this particular abstract. So what, what do you think of, of this drug and the CERD class in general? What are you thinking in terms of where you might use them when they're available and, and in what type of patients? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I think all these drugs are being positioned uh, as alternatives to fulvestrin, uh, both as first-line therapy as well as second-line therapy. Uh, and again, there's a number of combinations with these agents, um, uh, you know, both with PI3 kinase inhibitors as well as CDK4-6 inhibitors uh, and other drugs. And there's also um, you know, a lot of interest and in, there's actually a trial, NSCBP B61, uh, that's gonna actually use these drugs in the adjuvant setting versus aromatase inhibitors. I will add a note of caution. Uh, there was a trial uh, called Parsifal that was I think presented either, at, I think it was last year's ASCO, uh, I'm not, or, or last year's San Antonio, I forget which one, uh, but the Parsifal trial was fulvestrin and uh, a palbociclib versus or, uh, an astrazole and palbociclib, and there was no difference uh, in progression-free survival. Uh, so the hope uh, is that because these drugs, unlike palbociclib, uh, actually uh, induce responses in ESR mutant uh, cancer, uh, that this is hopefully will have a better result than the Parsifal trial. And so mm -hmm. that's the note of caution that we have to have with these. And so that's kind of where this will go, the whole class which one will come out the winner or multiple winners and which one will be optimal. I don't think anybody knows at this point. I think the one thing we do know is that these drugs do have more, at least this one doesn't apparently, um, uh, but other ones uh, had uh, side effects uh, that went over and above uh, what we typically expect with fulvestrin. So, you know, hopefully these are gonna have increased costs versus fulvestrin, which is generic right now in the United States. Uh, and the other thing I think that's important is that these have more side effects. So they better have more efficacy if they're really going to displace fulvestrin. That's sure. my view on this. Dr. Bradishar, any comments? Yeah, I mean, it's a race to the finish line with all of these. And they're, they're being developed in sort of a, a non-traditional non way, in a sense, because they're leapfrogging over the usual way we uh, develop drugs. You know, it's sort of an impatient way of going about it. But strategically, it makes sense. And as Adam said, you know, there were four or five of these drugs in some fashion that either at posters or presentations at ASCO this year 
and they all have you know sort of the same number of patients. They all seem to work in ESR mutations to some degree. Uh, they all have perhaps some distinct possible side effect, whether it's ocular, whether it's bradycardia, whatever. So the other thing that they're doing is they're combining, you know, they're not just getting the phase two single agent efficacy data, they're going right to the combination, uh, you know, trying to leapfrog in their position in how we use these drugs ultimately, you know, in, in the clinic, you know, they're trying to move up right into the first line right from the get-go. So it's sort of an interesting battle here, and this will be the CERD wars. We've had the Taxane wars, the CDK 4-6 wars. Now we're going to have the CERD wars. It'll give us all something to talk about for the next five years. Right. That's a very good point. And we also have the AI wars. You've got those in the early part of the yeah. 2000s. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, it is just something else to let academics kind of, you know, talk about this for you know the next five to 10 years. The AI wars seem like a distant memory. Um, Dr. Gratishar, can you introduce the second abstract, abstract 1068, real world clinical outcomes on alcoholism? Yeah, so the, the, my takeaway from this is obviously based on Solar 1, Apelosib was approved. And when the, the drug was being developed in the Solar 1 trial, the entry pathway was, you know, at least for those who had a PI3 kinase mutation, uh, that you had to have one of. I guess it was like 11 mutations in one of the three exons that were being evaluated. And as people know, the addition of Alpelicid enhanced clinical endpoints in those patients with PI3 kinase mutations. And one can you know, argue about uh, the tolerability in some patients, but the efficacy data was pretty clear. Now, the other issue is that as people started using different platforms to assess PI3 kinase mutations, there's a broader spectrum of mutations that can be identified. And I think that's really what this is, this poster, this presentation was really meant to look at. And that is whether or not those other things, uh, those other, I'm sorry, those other mutations identify patients who may benefit from alpelicin. And in fact, in some patients, there's more than one mutation present. And my takeaway from looking at this were a couple of things. One is, uh, not directly germane, but is that whether you're looking at it by a tissue or liquid biopsy, you can probably get similar information. There's pretty good concordance. And the second thing is, although there's a lot of other uh, so-called non-solar mutations that you can identify, it's sort of uh, case report responses. I mean, I don't know that we have enough data yet uh, in my mind looking at this, maybe others have a different opinion that we can say that, you know, if you have one of the other mutations that you're definitely gonna respond or not respond. It's just sort of a spectrum of things that you could see. So I think that really reflects the title, real world, you're gonna see a lot of different things, identify other things, uh, whether that'll turn out to be important drivers, uh, you know, of this pathway or not. It, 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 I'm not sure this data set makes that clear to me anyway. Sure. This is, this is pretty intriguing, the liquid biopsy part. How, how are you two assessing your patients with metastatic breast cancer for ER, PR, HER2, and other mutations that might be actionable? Are you using liquid biopsies or solid tissue biopsies? Liquids, liquids are a lot easier to do. I mean, I think Obviously, that yeah. it's much easier to order, you know, Garden 360 uh, in clinic than it is to kind of find the tissue block uh, and, you know, get it sent. Uh, it's just a lot easier to order. I mean, you know, sure, there are fewer mutations, but I think the, the, the liquid biopsy is getting more sophisticated. You know, we're now starting to look at you know, deletions and trying to do RNA-seq on the liquid biopsy. So we're getting closer. Um, this is an interesting study because you know, the, the issue really becomes, you know, the, 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 I guess it's called the, th the they have, a, I forgot the exact name of it, but there is a, you know, a, a, the, for solar, there is a specific, a mutation specific uh, test that you do on the blood in CTDNA that will miss a lot of these mutations. Mm -hmm. So it suggests that you need to do something a little bit uh, more comprehensive to pick up some of these mutations. And, and a few of them, as you know, looking at the table that you have here, uh, actually had responses. I think um, there was one there, uh, I'm just looking over the table, I forgot which one it was. I think it was the G1049R, you know, and there was another one that was uh, the N345K that wouldn't have been picked up uh, with the uh, companion diagnostic. So you know, this suggests that maybe we need to think about 
um, using uh, ctDNA. I mean, again, it's easier. And the, the theoretical reason is that if you just do one tumor, you right. know, how do you know that mutations in the other tumors? We know from autopsy studies that that's not the case. Right. And so I look at ctDNA as like averaging across the entire spectrum of mutations, even though that's probably not true. You know, you probably miss certain, maybe a tumor in the liver doesn't secrete the DNA or secrete cells in the blood and you're going to miss a mutation. So, you know, there's a lot of concordance, you know, between mutations, uh, even though, you know, this, uh, I gave you a theoretical concern. Right. Are you, are you both comfortable using liquid biopsy in breast cancer? Because in lung cancer, it's not sensitive enough to pick up actionable mutations. Yeah, well, I think as Adam um, suggested, it, it's certainly easier. Um, and we still have relatively few actionable mutations that we have therapies that we can utilize, um, you know, drugs that are available. So right. I think for what we do have available and the mutations which we can act upon, it's been pretty good. Yeah, where I think this is going, uh, and I'm not sure it's going to be as easy to do on, on liquid biopsy, uh, is where you're going to get is you're going to get a comprehensive, you're going to get RNA-seq, you know, which is all you're going to get RNA expression, which is part of RNA-seq to a degree. You know, you're going to get mutations out of RNA-seq. You're going to get amplifications, deletions, you know, either out of the DNA or other ways, probably from the RNA, you know, using various algorithms. And what you're going to do at the next level is you can do what's called pathway analysis. We're doing anyway in the lab. And so you're going to do pathway analysis clinically. And it's going to say, okay, this particular pathway, based on all the spectrum mutations, is maybe one that's a driver in this tumor. And maybe, you know, if it's like the mTOR PF kinase pathway, you'll have a, a broad variety of agents you could use to uh, kind of um, treat it. I mean, that's probably the next five to 10 years where I think this is going to go as we get more sophisticated. But there are already, you know, companies that are doing whole exome sequencing uh, as well as RNA-seq. And try and actually one of them, I think, Keras at this point has a clinical has a CLIA validated um, whole exome. Now, again, as Bill said, at this point in time, we have no idea what to do with the vast majority of data that comes out. But I suspect within the next five to ten years, we're going to be able to do stuff with it. Sure. And what line of therapy would you be looking for this actionable mutation? It really depends. I mean, I think that uh, we had, I think, a discussion at the ASCO metastatic breast cancer session a few days ago about that very question. Uh, you know, when they were finding out that there are particular mutations, you know, that even affect the first line therapy for somebody. And so, you know, we raised the question, even though it was a theoretical one, everybody agreed it, but the, you know, in the discussants agreed that there was really at this point, no reason to do it in the first line. I think a lot of us, at least for me in the ER positive, we do it everybody first line triple negative. I don't know about Bill. We do it everybody yeah. first line triple negative. And I particularly do it when there's the inklings of someone starting to progress uh, after the first line therapy. You know, you can be on first line therapy for two to three years, if not longer. You know, you kind of get that sense, maybe a new bone metastasis comes up, you don't quite want to change treatment, or someone who does tumor markers, they start to rise. You know, those are the sort of times I would think about doing uh, next gen in ER positive patient. Sure. And that's when it becomes even more appealing to have liquid biopsies in that situation instead of rooting around into somebody's bone. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, the third abstract, third and last abstract, Dr. Brucey, can you introduce? It's a nice analysis. Yeah, so this is interesting. So these guys from the FDA used all the data they had from the approvals a couple of years ago. And I forget what, this was a theater at San Antonio about three or four years ago. They looked at PFS uh, and they looked at toxicity. And it was really interesting in the prior one, they looked at, they said women over 75 may have had a little bit more toxicity, but on the other hand, they had the same efficacy. That was very useful for people. So this is now kind of one of these follow-up analyses where there's not overall survival data on most of the second line trials. These are not first line trials, although again, right. at, the, at, the, at the session, um, at the metastatic session a few days ago, Dennis Slayman did present data uh, at least the full vestrant part of, I believe it was Mona Lisa 2 or something like that. Um, and so they presented it and showed the benefit in the first line, but most of these were second line trials. And what they did is they looked at all the various subgroups and tried to look at the OS differences. And, you know, really just about across every subgroup, there was an OS benefit. Uh, that was a, really a thing I got out of this. You can see from uh, this particular uh, uh, abstract. I think that they had one area where it looked like Asian patients uh, didn't benefit uh, as well, and women under 40 
Uh, the women under 40, there were just too few patients, I think. If you see here, it's like 89. Uh, right. And I just don't think that's enough to make any comment on one way or the other. But the Asian patients, for some reason, there was a substantial number, actually, um, of these patients. Uh, and I think that uh, it's interesting that the hazard ratios were basically one. It was 0.95 with, a, with, a, with the confidence intervals crossing one. But it's, it's a really interesting piece of data. I mean, you know, it's all retrospective in a way. Um, and so it's hard to really, I mean, there's more hypothesis generating uh, than really, you know, something that we would use clinically. But I think it is gratifying uh, to note that you do have an OS benefit just about every, across almost every subgroup. That's what I really took away from this. And I, I would echo that. I mean, it, you get into these small subsets, hard to say anything. But, you know, would I avoid giving this to an Asian woman? No, I'd give it yeah. to everybody. Right. Right. But it, it starts to give some uh, granularity, perhaps, to some of these subsets, but some there's still just too few numbers. Right. Because right. we do know in Asian, in Asian patients, there's a pharmacogenomic issue where they tend to have to require, Asian patients require lower doses. They have a lot more neutropenia at the higher doses. Right. So, you know, I don't know if that translates somehow into less benefit. I'm not sure. You really can't make a, I mean, it's more hypothesis generated than anything. We have to kind of figure out a proper, maybe prospective analysis to kind of sort this out one way or the other. Right. Well, it's reassuring to see an overall survival benefit. Um, uh, is this a common situation where people would use a CDK inhibitor with fulvestrin? Because most oncologists will say fulvestrin until after oral AIs. Have well, remember, this is all second line data with the exception of the Mona Lisa studies. Now, I think that we have real world evidence, which is published. Uh, I was going to try to bring that up in the ASCO um, uh, metastatic session, but we didn't have time. Uh, there was real world evidence that was just published. I think it was in breast cancer treatment and research a couple months ago, where a bunch of us got together. Bill, I don't know if you were on that paper or not. But the thing is that no, that's what we basically looked, uh, a lot of us, you know, got together in Pfizer, you know, we look at this with palbociclib, uh, we basically look at the flat iron database uh, and did, you know, all of the various statistical techniques, try to balance two arms, almost a pseudo clinical trial, uh, and actually looked at progression, the overall survival in first line, uh, letrozole and palbociclib and found a, a substantial benefit. It mm -hmm. went for about 48 months to un, you know, to not reached at this point. And, it, it, you know, and the really interesting thing is that we're going to find out hopefully in the not too distant future, uh, is there going to be an overall survival benefit in Paloma 2? And is it going to be of the same magnitude? That's going to be really fascinating because that's going to tell us that real world evidence actually <laughs> is useful uh, and can maybe predict a randomized clinical trial. It is interesting when you look at the ribociclib uh, and fulvestrin uh, uh, part in the, in the Mona Lisa that Dennis Lehman presented last week, uh, you saw that in the control arm, it was very close uh, to the real world evidence paper. Um, and so that's really interesting. And that suggests that there probably will be a survival benefit when we get enough events in these. Because the problem is there's not a, enough events in the studies. So yes, it's true. This is more of a, remember, just to kind of get back to it, this is more of a second line study. This isn't a first line study. So most of us will use fulvestrin and a CDK4 and someone who hasn't had a CDK4 in the first line. Right. Yeah. Are you continuing CDK4 and people who progress on first line CDK4 and AI or? The standard answer that most people give is no. Right. Um, no. But if you look at the community, you know, a lot of people are just simply switching the hormonal agent from right. letrozole to palpus to fulvestrin, uh, figuring that, you know, I mean, in the future, if these really do, and there's a lot of prospective trials ongoing right now trying to ask this very question. Uh, and the interesting thing is one of the results of those prospective trials could be that if you have an ESR1 mutation, that's developed over long-term aromatase inhibitor use, uh -huh. maybe that's all you need to do is simply continue the CDK and just switch the hormonal partner. Although that's theoretical at this point. Right. And the short answer is that no one should be, you know, even though our community colleagues are doing it, you know, we don't have a lot of evidence to uh, support it right now. Right. Yeah, these are, the, these are the situations based on data we have today where we would right. do CTDNA and see if they have a PI3 kinase mutation and put them on a palisib if, if they hadn't gotten, you know, gotten Right, but if they have an ESR1 mutation, you know, a lot of us will say, okay, we're gonna, you know, if you have an ESR1 and PI3 kinase, what will happen is that you'll go uh, palisib and fulvestrin. If you just have an ESR1, a lot of us will just do fulvestrin and maybe a varolimus or progression or something like that, or right. some other agent. Yep. And uh, this trial says ACDK4 slash six inhibitor. Any, any thought about whether there's a difference between the inhibitors? 
clinically. I'll let Bill start with that. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's three drugs, three sets of trials that show significant activity <clears throat> and uh, pharmacologically, structurally, they're different. Uh, they have different toxicity profiles. They have, um, um, you know, their, their administration schedule is different. So they're not chemically the same. And depending on how big a proponent you are of one versus the other, uh, you may feel convincingly that it's clear one is the best. Um, there is emerging data with certain drugs that maybe they do confer a better survival benefit, but there are no direct comparisons between these drugs. Mm -hmm. So that, that's where you're limited and it's all extrapolation in my view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. And if you look at the trials, I think the biggest differences are really in how the patients are defined you know, and, and especially in the second line, I mean, a third of the patients with right. the palpacic and the Paloma trial had prior chemo. And when you look at the ribo trials, like most of, a lot of them were de novo. Right. And so, you know, there's a, there's a, I think the pace selection has a lot to do with it. That being said, as Bill said, there's differences uh, in uh, the IC50 for all these agents where um, a Bemisic cyclid has, mo has a much lower IC50, so it binds tight more tightly. Uh, to uh, the CDK4 molecule. And I think that's one thing. I think another thing that hasn't been explored enough and is ex all these agents, you know, they just don't bind to CDK4-6. They bind to a lot of other things, you know, and so they're like what we call promiscuous receptor, promiscuous agents that bind and they're, they're kino maps. There's, there's maps of all the CDKs and other, other tyrosine kinases in the cell that these bind to, and they're different. And maybe there are minor differences in the three, there are clearly differences of toxicity, uh, but maybe there are minor differences in efficacy that we just haven't teased out yet. So that's you, just something I think- Either, either of you have a go-to choice based on toxicity then, or? I use Palbo. Okay. Palbo. I'm trying to use more of Bema, but I've used Palbo quite a bit. Gotcha. Yeah. All right, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, Kishina, do you have any parting, parting thoughts? No? Great, yes, I do. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Gratisher, Dr. Bruski, and Dr. Nuff, thank you so much for moderating. Um, and to our audience, thanks so much for joining us. I do wanna say that um, keep a lookout for more uh, panel discussions. We'll, specifically in oncology, we'll be having some in September following um, IASLC and ESMO, both of which are happening in September. Um, and this particular discussion will also be available for replay um, on our YouTube channel. And a link to that will be sent out to all the audience members. Um, and to our panel, thank you so much for a great discussion. I know I learned a lot and I'm sure our audience feels the same way. Thanks again. Okay, thank thanks so a lot. Thank, thank you. Take care. Take care now.